start off with just talking about light. So light is just a very narrow region of the broader scale for electromagnetic radiation. So sometimes we'll just refer to all of electromagnetic radiation as light, but technically visible light is just a small little window of that. We got all the rest, and you should definitely know the whole scale. What's it's on your hand out there? What's the highest energy? Yeah. Well, gamma rays. Where do you find gamma rays typically? Uh, nuclear power plants. Yeah, nuclear radiation. Great, pretty harmful for you. High energy electromagnetic radiation going to cause you problems. What's right below gamma rays? X-rays. X-rays, which won't give you cancer quite as fast or kill you quite as fast, but they will eventually kill you. That's why the dentist puts a nice lead vest over you and leaves the room, right? So gamma rays, then X-rays, what's next? You Ultraviolet, which will kill you and it'll take even longer. So especially if you are fair-skinned like near you. So. And after ultraviolet comes visible, and what's the highest energy visible light? Violet, which is why it's right next to ultraviolet. Then you go through the entire spectrum with the whole, you know, Roy G. Biv and stuff like that. What's after the visible spectrum? IR. IR, infrared, and infrared's right next to red on the visible part of the spectrum. What's after IR? Microwaves, and then finally lowest energy? Radio, Radio waves. So, and again, as we go from low energy to high energy, we're also going from low frequency to high frequency. But it's the opposite trend for wavelength. As you go from low to high energy, you're going from long to short wavelengths. Cool. In this case, it turns out we've got frequency and wavelength for electromagnetic radiation. So it turns out the frequency, which we call nu here in chemistry, sometimes we use F in physics classes, but the Greek letter nu here, this is not the letter V, and then lambda here, and the wavelength of any wave times the frequency of any wave will always equal the speed of that wave. In this case, the speed of a light wave, speed of light. What's the speed of light? 3.998 Which, guess what we're gonna round it to? 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Cool. Yeah, so that's the key. Because this is in meters per second, when you're gonna do some plugging and chugging here in either set of equations we give you, that's gotta be in meters. So frequencies measured in? No, what's, what's frequency measured in? Well, notice if this is meters right here, and this is meters per second, what must frequency be in? Per seconds. <laughs> so, and what do we call a per second? Uh, S to the negative one. No. So per second, we can describe anything per second. Like how many times I'm punching you in the arm. <laughs> per second, hertz, don't it? Really. And a per second is called a hertz. Yes, so hertz, H-E-R-T-Z. I hope so. So usually stupid, ridiculous, or funny examples ram it home. Cool, frequencies are measured in hertz, which is the same thing as a per second, a one over second, or a seconds to the minus one, same diff. So other side of the coin, Electromagnetic radiation, we thought about its wave-like behaviors. It has wavelength and frequency, but it's not just wave-like behavior. We found out later on that it also exhibits particle-like behavior as well. And we call these light particles photons. And the energy of a photon is proportional to its frequency. You double the frequency, you've doubled the energy of the photon. So in this case, this is the Greek letter nu again. If you rearrange the top equation, what's nu? C over lambda. Good, kind of the point. That's the really stupid chemistry joke. So what's new? And they're supposed to say C over lambda, not like what happened over the weekend. All right, in this case, if you substitute this in right here, what do you get for the energy of a photon? Um, yeah, so now we can see that the energy of a photon and its wavelength are inversely proportional. You double the wavelength, you've cut the energy in half. And so that's why as energy and frequency go up, wavelength goes down. Cool. You might be doing a whole series of calculations with this. There are three variables in these equations. Wavelength, frequency, and energy. There are two constants in these equations, the speed of light, and then H here we call Planck's constant. Neither one of these do you have to memorize. Yeah, for right now, not so much. So some chemistry professors, even freshmen, will make students memorize these. Some don't, you guys don't. So, and later on, maybe, maybe not. 
Uh, in this case, there are three variables, two constants. If there are three variables, if I want you to solve for one, what do I need to give you? Two of them, or maybe even only one. If you notice in this equation, there's two variables and a constant. Because there's only two variables, if you know one, you know the other, or at least you can calculate the other. So, but also, with these two equations, each of these only contain two variables. So if you know one, you can calculate the other. If you know one, you can calculate the other. And so it turns out that if we look at wavelength, frequency, and energy, they all depend on each other. If you know any one of these three, you can actually calculate the other two. And let's do that, have a little fun. So let's talk about violet light for a minute. In fact, let's get as close to violet as I can here. Violet light has a wavelength of 400 nanometers, let's say. So what have I given you? So what can I ask you? You can ask me what the frequency is. Good, what's the frequency and? And what's an energy of a photon? So I give you the wavelength, I can say what's the frequency, and I can say what's the energy. And that's what I'm going to ask. So we've got the wavelength. Which one do you want to solve for first, frequency or energy of a photon? Let's get frequency. So we'll use this equation here. If we use the rearrange, what's new here, we just set up right there. And as you pointed out, Natali, so with the speed of light being 3.0 times 10 to the eighth, Cool, I'm not gonna do it that way. I'm actually gonna turn this guy into meters instead. And I would recommend you do the same. So uh, you can do it either way. Either go turn this into nanometers for a second and leave this in nanometers, but I would probably turn everything into meters. It's the SI unit and you'll do it routinely in physics if you use meters instead of nanometers. So in this case, I don't wanna put 400 nanometers here. So I need to convert that. So in this case, 400 nanometers. I need nanometers on the bottom, meters on the top. Which one of these gets the one in front of it? Nope, the one with the prefix. <laughs> and what does nano actually mean? 10 to the what? Negative nine. Negative nine. And so in this case, it's really just 400 times 10 to the minus nine. That's not proper scientific notation, and I don't care. I'm just doing a calculation here. And I'm gonna let my calculator do all the work anyways. And the meters are gonna cancel, and what units is this gonna come out in? per seconds, which is called a Hertz, HZ, sweet. There you go, that sounds better. And that's Hertz, which is the same thing again as seconds to the minus one or one over seconds. Take your pick, but it'll probably be in Hertz as an answer choice on the exam. Cool. Now we've got the frequency, what else can we solve for? Not, well, we already had the wavelength. Yeah, let's get the energy photon. Which equation do you want to use? We now have both the frequency and the wavelength, so you can use either equation. Which one do you want to use? This one's a little easier to me as well, so we're going to use this equation to get that energy of the photon. We'll use the frequency we just calculated right there. And I'm gonna write that as seconds to the minus one so that you can see that seconds times seconds to the minus one cancels. And we're left with an answer in? Uh, Excellent. So, and in joules, what's my answer come out to? Uh, 4.9695 Give me that one more time. Okay, 4.9695 times 10 to the minus 19. Awesome, 4.97 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Cool. It turns out it's just a proportionality constant. So notice if, if you know, if for every inch I grow, I gain 10 pounds, I, that's a proportion, right? And it's a one to 10 ratio. Well, it turns out this was the perfect ratio to make this work but it's not the only place it shows up. It just keeps rearing its ugly head in other places. It's a weird little constant. It's kind of like pi, right? Pi, ratio involving a circle. Shows up in a lot of other places though, really weird. Cool, we're gonna talk about what's called the photoelectric effect. So 
So, and this was one of the pieces of evidence that started leading us to believe in quantum theory. So, quantum theory, does that sound fun? Yes. You say yes. Do you think <laughs> quantum theory sounds fun? Uh, quantum jump theory, I think. Not quantum, just quantum theory in general. So, sound like something you just want to pick up a book over the weekend, read up some quantum theory? <laughs> not for most people, not for most people. Here's the deal. Quantum theory, the basic premise here, is that things are quantized in certain things. And when we say things are quantized, only means that certain quantities are allowed. That's it, that's all it means. So if I had a quantum car, let's say, and that its velocity was quantized, so it could only go certain velocities, certain speeds. Let's say in first gear, it goes 10 miles an hour. Second gear, it goes 30 miles an hour. In third gear, it goes 60, and in fourth gear, it goes 100. And those are the only speeds it does. And when I go from gear to gear, it doesn't like speed up to the next speed. It instantaneously accelerates to the new speed, instantaneously. So, and those are the only speeds it does. It is impossible for that car to do any other speeds. Only those quantities for the speed are possible. That is a quantized car. Well, it turns out that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so early on, when people started saying that the energies of electrons in an atom are quantized, people are like, uh, you're kind of a whack job. You know, Mr. Bohr, you don't know what you're talking about. And Mr. Planck was in the, the, the argument is there talking about other things being quantized. And he's like, you guys are crazy. So in fact, early on, only a couple guys really had a good idea what was going on with quantum theory. And one of them said, if quantum theory makes sense to you, then I'm pretty sure you don't understand it. So and the idea is that it's not supposed to make sense because it doesn't make any sense. But it doesn't mean it's not true. So photoelectric effect was one of the first good evidence of this. If I have a piece of metal, metals have a lot of loosely held electrons. So and the electrons are held onto this piece of metal by the attraction to oh, the, the nucleus, the protons that are in the nucleus. So however, it turns out if you hit this with light of high enough energy, you can knock an electron and eject it right off of this metal. But only of high enough energy. Well, it turns out that you think that the energy of light was related to how intense the beam was. Like if I had a really faint red beam, or if I had a really like blinding red beam, they thought, oh, the, the blinding red beam is way higher energy because it's way more intense. Turns out it's not true. Red light is red light is red light. I don't care if you have a really intense beam or a really weak beam, every single one of those photons in there has the same energy. You just have more photons of red light when you have the really intense beam. And so it turns out if a red photon is not enough to knock an energy, you know, electron out of this, then it doesn't matter if you have a weak red beam or a strong red beam, ain't gonna happen. But if blue light is high enough energy because it's higher than red, then you could have the faintest blue light hitting this and it's still gonna knock electrons out. And the way it works, one photon can knock out one electron. So what would happen if I used a really intense blue beam? So yeah, it'd have more photons, so it would knock out more electrons. This is kind of the way it works. But again, anything that's below the threshold energy, any color of light that's below the threshold energy, I don't care how intense the beam is, it will not knock out any electrons. Oh, so like gamma rays and x-rays won't knock out any Oh, those are even higher energy. Actually, gamma rays and x-rays would definitely do oh, this. So, but if blue light's the threshold, then you're right. Infrared or even anything lower than blue on the visible spectrum is not gonna knock anything out. Now it takes it a step further. We say that the electron itself here that's ejected actually gets to keep any extra energy beyond the threshold as kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of the ejected electron is equal to the energy of the photon minus what we call the work function. And that work function represented by the letter phi here, it's just different for different metals. Different metals hold onto their electrons with different you know, energy, so to speak. So, but that's the threshold energy a photon must have. Let's just say I told you this was 10 joules. If I hit it with a photon that has only eight joules, is it gonna knock it off? Nice. No, it's not gonna happen. It's gotta, if the work function's 10 joules, my threshold for a photon is it's gotta have an energy of at least 10 joules to knock it off. So photon, again, is just when we look at a piece of light. I like to think of it as a light bullet. Light, when we look at it, sometimes looks like a wave. Sometimes it looks more like a bullet, like a particle. And so it turns out that light is not just this continuous wave. It has some characteristics like that, but it actually, when light's 
hitting you, there's little particles of light that are actually hitting you. And they, we, we call those photons. So if you notice, if you ever watch the old Star Trek, and they're like, hit them with a photon torpedo. <laughs> hit them with some light. Turn the lights on. I don't know. It just sounds dumb when you really know stuff. So science movies get a little boring when you kind of know too much. But anyhow, so these are just little light bullets, if you will. And so when a light bullet hits an electron here, the light bullet has to have a greater energy than what we call the work function of the metal. So again, if this is 10 joules for a work function, that means the light I hit it with has to be no less than 10 joules or we will not eject an electron. What it also says though, is that if you hit it with exactly 10 joules, that that gets the electron off, but it just kind of just hovers out there. It doesn't really leave with any kinetic energy, energy of motion. But if I hit it with a little extra, let's say I give it a photon of 12 joules of energy, then the electron gets to keep the extra, which is how much in this case? Two joules. So, and we would never use joules in this case. Electrons are never going to have that much energy. We'd more commonly use what we call electron volts, which are much smaller amounts of energies for much smaller things like electrons and stuff. But you get the point here. What you should take away is this. One electron can get ejected per one photon, but only if it's over the threshold, over the work function.